a lot of things fail. And I'm, I'm, in a way, I'm quite pleased with that because I think that uh, whereas in the good old days, uh, you know, a, a, an institution, an educational institution, could could say to themselves, "Well, we've we've had, you know, Joe Bloggs from Acme Industries coming to talk to us, and they've said we need to have uh, three thousand tablets. Yeah, students will do better with three thousand tablets. We've We've, we've run a pilot project with another school. We gave them 3,000 tablets. That's the optimum number. And uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, that's the payload, so to speak. And students, you know, uh, went, up a, went up a grade. Yeah. 3,000 students went up by one grade. And so these 3,000 tablets will pay for themselves in you know, five or six years. So let's, let's do this. And so the whole educational institution, you know, spends all their money on those three thousand tablets, and they spend another three or four years training all the teachers to be able to use the tablets, and then it fails because you know in three or four or five years' time, the technology is now redundant. Those tablets are now worthless. Uh, students never liked them in the first place. You know, there's there's, there's all sorts of things. Um, it's almost like, well, the only way for those 3,000 tablets to work is to have a, a, a pile of champions within the college or within the institution who are already conversant with the technology, who are already able to enthuse everybody to use it, uh, who are able to keep pushing and keep pushing them and keep pushing it to get those results that the salesmen were talking about in the first place. So where we are now, though, is that the technology that we have available can be cheap, it can be inexpensive, and you can keep failing. And this is really good because every time I fail, I can say, right, why did I fail? What made it fail? And so if that technology fails because of that particular reason, what is the other technology that I can use? Failure is the way we learn, you know. Yes. That's an important point. Experiment, things go wrong, you know, and learn from it. Think about you and me, right? We're, we're just normal, everyday Joes. If I was given a bottle of wine that I found impossible to open, you know, it just gets worse and worse, isn't it? You get a bottle of wine, you say, right, it's got a cork. It's not, a, you know, it's not a screw cap, it's a cork. It's, a, it's, it's the old-fashioned cork, right. I've now got to find another tool. I've got to go and find, you know, a corkscrew. All right, I put in the corkscrew. I'm not very conversant at using this, and it's one of those old-fashioned ones. It's not a waiter's helper. It's one of those ones that you have to twist and turn. So I put it in. I don't put it in far enough. I've broken the cork in half. Right, I'm still not at the bottle of wine yet. You know, there's still a bottle of wine. I've still got half a broken cork. Okay, and then, you know, Martin King's with me, and he says, well, you know, the way I do it is I try to push the cork in. So I push it in. I go, oh, do you know what? My, my, I can't push it in. I haven't got anything to push it in with. Um, it's it's dangling halfway there. What do we do now? And then somebody else will turn around and say to me, well, the way I found it works, if you break the neck of the bottle, you'll get the wine. It's like, right, okay, so let's smash it against a wall. Right, there's now glass in the wine. You know, corks everywhere. Um, and Martin King goes, well, if you get some toilet paper and put it in a, you know, we can filter the wine through the toilet paper. To, my God, all I got given was a bottle of wine. So why not have a screw cap? Yeah. Twist. It's, it is, isn't it? It's, a literally, it's literally a case of twist and go. There you go. We've done it now. You know, all we had to do, though, is we have to convince everybody that a, cork, that a twist cap is as good as a corked bottle of wine. There's, there's a lot of snobbery involved as well, isn't there? Yeah, yeah there is, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing with teaching and learning. People don't, you know, if the if the technology is frustrating to use. Now, I've just I've, I've used corks and I've referred to snobbery, but I've also used corks to refer to if I put in technology and say, well, first of all, you have to log on, then you need to generate a password, and then the password's got to have capital letters, lowercase letters. Numeri and then you have to do this, and then you have to type in the address. You know, you know this this mixed combination of numbers and letters. You've got to get it right. Then you have to, then you have to get a 
oh, you have to use a stylus. You can't use your finger. You have to use a stylus to, mm. or you have to connect a mouse, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. You know, people just, it, it's not even attention span, I don't think. I think it's just sheer frustration. Yeah, you talk about something, yeah, that, that, that there's going to be, yeah, future possible disconnect if education doesn't change between technologies and modes of operation that learners are familiar with, you know, um, on their mobile phones in particular. Yeah. And they come and sit in front of a desktop computer, you know, uh, with a mouse, you know. Um, they may have laptops, yeah, they may still use laptops at home. Yes. I wonder how many, you know, really use a mouse. I haven't used a mouse since the year, well, just the end of 1999, you know, I can still use it, but it seems a bit odd to me. But uh, Well, I, I tried uh, this year, as, as I was saying to you uh, before we started the recording, unfortunately, this year has, for me, has been a case of reflecting on all the processes and all the technologies I've tried to implement in the class. And rather than thinking of anything new or trying to adapt anything or anything else, I just said, look, these are the tools I've got, which work, which don't. And one of the things I actually wanted and I never actually got, I thought to myself, I'd like to have four or five desktop computers back in the room again because students don't charge their phones or they can't log on or there's no instant connection. That the, the Students are not savvy enough to always be readily prepared with the technology that they already have. There are no fail-safes. You know, and I thought, if I had four or five desktops, I'd just switch them on, and then when the student says, sir, I can't do this, I say, look, there's the lap, there's the desktop, go, go, go. But at least you're still connected, you're in, you're still in. That was the important thing for me. And um, the powers that be said, no, 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 what we'll do is we'll, we'll We'll set up another computer suite. I said, no, that's, that's not the idea. I'm not about to take 20 students over to another computer room so they can all sit down and switch on and password and username. And No, it has to be instant. What you're saying, that there's really good got a diversity of, of technology in the classroom yes. because that's the way it started, again, way back 1999, 2000. You know, yeah, we put out a few, well, they call, I can't remember what we called them at the time, but there, there were classrooms with two or three desktops in them. Yes. And that was the idea that students could share on them and they could use them for research. You know, you could, you could have multiple activities in the classroom, you know, and you could circulate around. Yes. But, but, yeah, like you say, the powers that be, the model became maybe a power brokerage thing going, oh, I've got X number of IT suites, 